after the, after the presentation, then um, I think what we'll do, depending on how many people are here, is we'll have one handheld mic that can go and present a question. Yeah. Question. Okay. And so, so I'll just have a yeah. you mic Okay. Okay. Yeah. Somebody so raise their hand, hand, put the mic, mic. ask questions once they're done, take the mic from them. Where would you like us to be positioned for that? I got to make a starting point. Maybe the push forward. Well, they're, they're basically, basically, yeah, well, we only have two mics. That's the mic. And so, so we'll have, have hands on. on. Don't, don't think, think. I don't think that Jennifer needs to move around. Um, I guess, better question. Are you going to have us be like in the audience? So the word. Yeah, so the word. Yeah, during the piece, maybe if you, you know, yeah, I mean, sit and watch and enjoy it. And, um, and, and maybe just, you know, yeah, like sit on the end. So, so then, then when it comes time to do the question and answer, it's not like you're having to get out of yep. the middle. Mm -hmm. and then So I'm a transfer student, so I already have all my stuff done. So board one. I finished my, I, did, I, I didn't I, do English comp one two years ago. Well, this is also extra credit for English comp. And she had a lot of specific things on it. Which I did for the notebook. I also thought of like, the recording the English later because I have the app. Well, so like my app kind of like records it and then makes it like for me. It's that really thing. Yeah, I don't know. I need my phone somewhere in the speaker because if it doesn't pick up his voice, then I don't know. Well, like the nearest speaker. I think that I remember them. I think I did it still have to. I'm going to. The Zoom call will automatically be recorded to the YouTube stream. And very similar. Yes, yes. After I do the edit, Chris. Yeah, this is a really good play. You just open the last uh, uh, It's going to go the whole edit classes and stuff like the TEDx thing, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. You know how long that may take? Oh, no. Yes. Sorry, I'm not doing the TEDx thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Becky, yeah. 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 Yes. 
but I don't know what I'm doing. So this week was the first time. This last week, yeah. Oh, yeah, just really bums. Harriet, we met Maya, we met Josephine. <laughs> Thank you. I was there last year, too. No, just our friend, Cody. So, even that was essentially our friend. Oh, yeah. Can I go to the <laughs> well, I, I hope this sets the precedent for this to be a good thing to have it. Yeah. We're really happy that y'all are open to that. It really does take the Sure. We're really having a good time. Then, you know, I got your journal input you later, um, after, afterwards. And I checked. So, <laughs> I want to make sure we get some slides ready so that we can have a job. Oh, so she's staying. Oh, okay. Yeah, I only joke say that it's so now you're cool. People can Urban Dale Arts. Yeah, that's like I was like, I feel like this one looks so bad. Stories. 
Oh, I wonder how to see those things. A national company that sells stage lighting. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, that was probably 16. Yeah, I was going to say, I said either blue or red. And she puts down hazel. She goes, no, hazel. I was like, I guess my turn is 21. He's like, up on. I don't know. So when I got my driver's license when I was 16, mm -hmm. I the woman was like, I color and I said I blue or gray. Hey, and this woman looks at me and goes, um, oh, from the slides so I was shown at the beginning. Um, did I just email that to you? Slides, the slides that we're gonna show, that we're gonna project, or have at the very least have as part of the we have the ability to put anything on the I don't want to throw you a curveball. Huh? I don't want to throw you a curveball, but that was. You discussed that or? No, the, during the first walkthrough, way back when. I should have reminded you yesterday. If not, don't worry about it. We, we can, uh, we can add um, a thumbnail or something to the, to the, uh, to the video later. But if it's a quick, if it's easy, it use, it let's just, do it. Use his But then it would be on your. Um, use your laptop, Adrian. Say what? Use your laptop. Of course, yeah. Is there anything you would like for us to do? No. I don't know if we're going to be able to pull this one off. Because actually my port's not working. Mm -hmm. We plug into a different port, maybe, and just so that they're just on this. Can you hear me fine? Are you able to hear it at all? It's <laughs> okay, just keep talking. I know I gotta pull my gotta pull my there's a lot where Jerry Sunfold is famous for for the thing like what's the deal with airline. My best friend quotes that all the time. Yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, ye
Yeah, help me. You know where I'm talking about. Get some nice uh, root beer. Yeah. I make it in house. Beer. Is it root beer or root beer? Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's the word for the country. Oh, I meant. I meant like, is it like beer made by root? No, it's root. It's the soda. Exactly. Your works has some nice one. It's cute. You can give me that bird. Some frill is the same thing as root. I'm making a college student. I'm making the college student. My book can't be so long. Do you have a note? Do you have a quote for God? It's a completely different word. We don't, but we should. Okay. I'm going to start that right now. Okay. I'll just turn my phone on. As a theater department, we have a game where it's like at the end of every show, there's a quote. I'll write down who quotes from, and then we have to guess who it's from. But you know, oh, oh. I know. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody was monitoring me for like a set, I was probably just still monitoring. Pulled by me right across the stage and getting some. That was a majority of the talking. I just or, JD, can you come like sit on this piece of wood real quick? It's really badly warped. Um, followed by another that, string of curses. Yes. Never asked me to sit on a piece of wood. I'm asking to stand on a piece of wood. I did ask you to stand on this. I don't like say that specifically, <laughs> but I see it's cute that you do something a lot. It's cute that you think that I know what that means. Oh, you also just put down, did you, what did you say? I don't like when I don't like when random women call me mine. I told Julia that. <laughs> It's not random women. She's like, come on. I, I, well, I didn't say random. I don't like it when women pretend to be my mother. Yeah. So, <laughs> it, it was said it's, like so it's deadpan. Somebody. You had not seen it. It's, it's kind of so <laughs> It was just the way you like presented the like. I don't like what random women. <laughs> so like just. So. Dude, that's happened to me. I was on a security job doing um what do you mean it's happened to you? <laughs> the random woman. It was a random van. Yeah, that's weird. Oh. Okay. So um it was a homeless guy too. And so like we do um patrol down the entry and it's like a walking patrol, basically what we do on the college. But there we're basically kicking people off at midnight and then we have to make sure that staying on the entry, we get the alleys and everything. And like there was this one, it was the first time I ever did that post. I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, I was not trained for that at all. And then this, like, there was a guy who kind of looked like he was getting ready to like set up his camp, you know? And so I just like tagged him for a while. Um, and then eventually I called my people and I'm like, what do you want me to do about this? And I'm like, I'm like just hang out and be there in a second. I was like, okay. So then I was like across the street from him, just like chilling, pretending to play on my phone. And then he walks across the street and he's like, Are you my daughter? And I was like, oh, I don't think so. He's like, I'm pretty sure you're my daughter. And I'm like, I know who my dad is, it's not you. That is freaky. It's pretty good than yeah. somebody who played your mother. Who played your mother? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's more about how she said it. Of course. It was it's more like that. Her. Just the standing yeah. in the pose and then come to mommy. And she always did the thing too where she like you know well, like, like like this, you know, like this yeah, like, you, you together. I'm sure you can see Julia there. Yeah. yeah. I knew her for like, two days and I could picture her her exact stance. Yeah. And I feel like it was usually followed up with like your mom's special board or something or something like that. That's kind of like, okay. <laughs> like I like you, Julia, but it's like why why do you like <laughs> yeah. your mother? If I thought it was serious, I would have said something. Yeah. Like with Mike and the middle parts. Yeah. And then I'll Yeah. Oh. I really hope you might have to do that. Well, I told you mine. I have it there. I like that. Sweet. I love that. Yes. 
he will be up in war. How are we doing, sir? Did I bring my computer over? Just think, I think, no, you can sit like up this side. 
and we will take a mic. Yeah. We're going to start with the mic. Okay. Tanya and Pablo have a quick change, but I think that's because they're trying to do something different for the pro line for seeing something in the pro line. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I think that's because if we have a tie problem, so we did have a tie problem, but it's not between the pro line. It's like between, you know, three and four or something. It's, so I'm I don't know looking at it, but I was watching it, just couldn't get it. I don't want to lie. Oh, I, I felt like it was not that great, but oh, we skipped so we skipped some lines and we just were effortless in our <laughs> Yeah, it worked. I never would have known. Well, hello, how are you? How are you? Good. Good. How are you guys feeling? You know, it's a rush to get it all done. Oh, yeah. oh I, mean, I was fine. So it's for the first show and then I was like, you're so right. I went back and I crashed. Good. 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 Yes. Good. 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 Because he's not using it as part of his presentation. Well, he's not on sure. the so, so basically, yeah. so I'm going to do an intro first, and I'm going to pass it on to Jennifer Macias, who's going to introduce the performance. And if, um, when she comes up, you can shut this down, shut the slides down. Do you know how to do it? She's not there. 
Isn't it this here? You just shut this I mean, let's, let's ask her. If you show me where I can yeah, do okay. it, slash, I can figure it out. I've done some work. I'll go look. I'll go look. And then I think the slides have to be here's a button to get rid of the screens. Yeah, if you show me where they are, I can totally do that. I'm just not sure where everything is. I'm not technologically savvy. My bosses. Sandwich. Yeah. I just need John Boyd here, <laughs> and that would be like what, three decades. There we go. Right. Actually, Daryl Yarrow's here too. He's my boss so briefly. <laughs> Is it for me? I made it up. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to read so I think if it was appropriate. They might not fully appreciate it. Right. Yeah. I'm just going to see it. You have always open it. Yeah. 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 Last semester, I was doing the main program. That will grab your seat. <laughs> 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 hey, hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? The show is trying to do Oh, hello, Laura. <laughs> Good. I thought somebody said they were busing students up. Is that your yeah. 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 I do think that some schools are. I'm hopefully they're planning. Sorry. Sounds like I've never been to Chautauqua. I mean, I've heard about it for years. I think you a really great one in Grand Junction. Yeah, it is so cool. We've got adults and kids. Put it in here, please. Thank you. 
That's exciting. Yeah. I think it's a really good time. Do you think that that's kind of like a normal thing, like as the program continues and evolves, that the classes have to evolve? Or you ready for? No, we just it's cozy. Well. In a way, it feels like what we're doing in some ways is going back to the program that's supposed to do the great number of some natural sciences. I guess that's sustainability is supposed to be both. But another program developed. So now our program is social science. And so it's like we're like separating. Yeah. Maybe we'll come back together again later. And when it was trying to do everything, it wasn't really working well, anyways. Because many of our students came trying to be like psychologists, so we, we were like the people, yeah. Yeah. institutions, organizations, and they they were like, I don't want to. I want to go out and see it. So now they can all go do that. And they can have people that are interested in social change. But now we need to find a way to integrate further. Yeah. 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 And our students will still take some environmental science. And their students will still say have like a policy course, some social science. Um, but now they're how like when sustainability started, we didn't have schools. Now we have schools with different means, so it becomes more silent than we were. When it's dark. Uh, yeah. uh, but we're, we're going to keep sharing the conference. So, uh, I know what both groups share faculty. I'm really jealous of being able to change our last Yeah. Like just design it ours. Without messing with the speed. Oh, man. I was just talking to Jane after that. Should I break the Yeah, it's well, what, what, it's, what, what is it? Oh, one yeah, teach and it's, a, it's a state class. Mm -hmm. We used to teach the human <laughs> wilderness and the American oh. epic. Yeah. So, I mean, not necessarily that one. Just the right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That would well, appeal more to our students in general. Yeah. So, I'm like, how do I? How do I keep humanity's alive? <laughs> when <laughs> there's zero flexibility here, <laughs> like, you know, I didn't oh, know what was the case, but I on Oh, yeah. 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 Well, um, what it's worth, and I'm, I'm having the students write their exit essays as they leave the program. Oh. We assess those for program assessment. And no, many no, no, of them, no, no, no. the huge hundred students that are supposed to be literature, Yeah. Yeah. That, it just know how to market itself. It's so broad. Yeah. They've asked her to teach that class. The brown she's asking. Yeah, right up in the corner. They, they are right there. Yeah. Talk to her. Oh, God. It's that the whole problem where you know, everybody's like pressuring you to what are you doing know, if you do career wise, but the odds are competitive for it. But then from a sustainability perspective, you look at it and the market, the job market, yeah, the market that requires the sustainable, yeah. sustainable enterprise to begin with. So we're trying to, you know, how do you find that balance? That we're trying to find the balance. Yeah. So, so we can just sell out and do everything the market wants us to do. I, I do, you know, I do feel responsible to the students to give them some career trajectory. Agreed on all of them. Right? Is it? 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 Is it?
to do yeah. this. What yeah. role like sort of embedded into Jedi curriculum? Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. Copy exists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been having it's being deleted and erased. Yeah, yes, it should. Yeah, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. I think some of that might just be there. Greetings. <laughs> uh, greetings to everyone out in YouTube, YouTube land, as well as all these beautiful souls assembled here at Mortgage Commons in Glenwood Springs. Uh, my name is Adrian Victor Fielder, and I'm an assistant dean here at Colorado Mountain College. It is my honor uh, today to tell you why we're here, and that is uh, CMC is proud to celebrate Black History Month. And one of the ways that we do that each year is by partnering with Colorado Humanities to host a performance of their dynamic Chautauqua series that they put on every February called Black History Live. Now, uh, Chautauqua, if you haven't heard of it before, is a performance on a form in which actors uh, portray historical figures and in the process teach live audiences about the life and times of those figures. So in the past, Thanks to Colorado Humanities work with scholar actors such as Becky Stone and others. Uh, we have been graced by such luminaries as Harriet Tubman, Malcolm X, Maya Angelou, and most recently, last year, uh, Josephine Baker regaled us with her beautiful voice and music. Um, so this year, uh, we potentially could have met Rosa Parks being played by Becky Stone, uh, but her schedule conflicted with our TEDx conference uh, event last week. Uh, so instead, today, we get to meet the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as played by Martin Jefferson, who's gonna be up here in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I would like to thank uh, some of the many people who made this possible. Uh, starting with uh, CMC's IT wizards, Eric Arvin Trout. And Jim Neff, when we got into here, um, <laughs> who set up the live video stream that's making this uh, possible uh, to be accessible to a wider audience um, than could make it here today. I uh, also want to thank Linda English, Daryl Yarrow, and the Mortgage Commons crew. Uh, for being so hospitable during a time we have lots of other guests and clients. Um, and I also want to thank a uh, special thank you to Brad Moore, CMC's Theater Operations Manager, and to his students from our theater and event production program, uh, who are learning the skills to put on events just like this one. So uh, today we have Ashton, Dakota, and JD helping. Thank you for being here. So a really cool thing about that program is uh, the students get to apply their learning in real life contexts. Uh, first, through our very own Sopris Theater Company, which, by and by, just opened last night a delightful new production called Native Gardens, which is a play by Karen Zacharias that explores the rich landscape of reconciling racial injustice and white privilege through a, an absolutely hilarious story about a young Latinx couple uh, who find themselves in a land dispute with their elderly white neighbors. So we invite you to come up to Spring Valley to see this play during its run this week and next. So tonight and tomorrow, uh, 7 p.m. And Sunday, we have a matinee at 2 p.m. And then next week, we have the same schedule Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of next week, also 7 p.m. And we have one more matinee next Sunday at 2. So besides putting on the plays, uh, the students also get embedded with our community partners in the performing arts. And uh, one of those is CMC. So uh, they, they get to, to get out in internships and actually put their stuff into practice. And this is one of the ways that they do it. 
Um, but the most special thanks of all go to Colorado Humanities. So uh, thank you for having the vision to be a patron of the arts and to co-sponsor this event with us. Uh, so I'm going to invite Jennifer Macias to come up here, who's History Programs Coordinator with Colorado Humanities, who's going to introduce today's performance. Thank you all so much, and thank you for coming on a snowy Friday um, afternoon and getting to enjoy this experience. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jennifer Macias. I'm the History Programs Coordinator, and this is by far one of my favorite things about being in this position is just the ability to get to engage more with community members across the state. Every state has a Humanities Council. Colorado Humanities is your Humanities Council. So in addition to history programming, we do conversational pieces, and we also offer a home for the center of the book. So if you are an author, uh, a Colorado author, you're welcome to submit your books for submission in the year that you publish that book. And in June, we hold a big celebration and just congratulating and thanking all of the local Colorado authors. For Black History Live, um, we've had a first scholar, as was mentioned, Becky Stone did Rosa Parks for the first week. And our second scholar who's here with us today, Marvin Jefferson, is portraying Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And this is one of 10 performances that he's doing um, across libraries and entities and in schools as well. So this is just a really great opportunity to get to feel history come to life. If you've never been to a Chautauqua performance, um, Dr. Reverend, I should say, Dr. Martin Luther King will do his, um, share his history with us, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask him questions in character. Um, so as you're listening to him, please feel free to think about something that you might be interested in asking. Without further ado, I'll set the stage. The time is Sunday morning, April 30th, 1967. The place is the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is about to enter his study to grant an interview prior to the sermon he is giving this morning regarding his controversial stand on the Vietnam War. I don't normally uh, give an interview prior to a sermon, but uh, you are from Morehouse, yes? Okay, Mr. Cook, will you have a seat there? Had a seat right there. Um, I wrote for the Maroon Tiger, the paper of Morehouse, in 1947. I don't remember exactly what I wrote about, but I know it had something to do with injustice. And then it kicked out. Oh, did, did you bring your tape recorder? Okay, that's very good. I may need you to edit some things, not because I believe in censorship, but, um, well, I want to make sure that I'm very clear in terms of what I'm saying. As you know, I have not been receiving a lot of good press lately. Now, <clears throat> I did, well, let me say what I'm not going to do. Uh, I'm not going to talk about my views on the war right now. Um, you're going to stay for the sermon. You'll hear my views in full. Also, I'm not going to talk about uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Company moving to um, economic justice. That's going to be the focus. So, um, in addition to all the other focuses that we have. So, I did write down, we'll talk about that, of course, um, later on this evening or perhaps tomorrow. But I did write down the question that you, you know, just so I could think about them. Um, let's see, the political and spiritual journey of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That's the title. And the first question is, how did I arrive here? Now, <laughs> you being from Morehouse, I'm assuming you mean, how did I arrive here in terms of my views on the war and uh, the focus of SCLC regarding economic justice? Because just at face value, how did I arrive? Well, I arrived here by car. <laughs> <laughs> you being from Morehouse, I'm assuming you mean the former not the back. How did I arrive here? Well, Mr. Cook, I tell you, between the year I was born, 1929, to I would say uh, December the 1st, 1955, seemed as if my life was a great big business, ready to be opened up at any time. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. I was born here, 
born on Auburn Avenue, where we are right now, because you know the church is on Auburn Avenue. We are 501 Auburn Avenue to be exact. And um, I grew up in a very loving household. Uh, that's why the concept of love is not um, abstract to me. See, um, it's a real, a real thing, real support. You know, my um, my father, the Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., my, my mother, Alberta William King, my grandmother, Grandmother Williams, uh, we called her uh, Mother Dear. Uh, well, we called her Mother Mother Dear, called my grandmother Mom. And I tend to believe that I was her favorite, but, you know, the other siblings might have something to say about that, but I believe I was that in any case. And uh, there was my older sister, Christine, and my younger brother, A.D., Alfred Dan. And the household was a very loving, very supportive. And um, I didn't have to want for anything. Now, my mother, very sweet natured woman, very calm, very sweet natured. Uh, I don't remember there ever being any kind of disagreement or argument in the home. I never. Heard. And uh, she had this beautiful way about her. Now, she was emphatic when it came to telling her children that they were just as good as anyone else. And don't let anyone make us feel differently. She would be emphatic about that. But outside of that, her, her, her demeanor was calm and sweet, and I suppose I took on some of her personality. Very loving. Now, my father, my father was very loving as well. He just expressed his love differently. Uh, my father could be very um, intimidating. He had a very curt, direct way of speaking to people. It didn't matter whether they were black or white. It didn't matter. My father would speak the same way. Let me give you an example. Uh, one day I was very young. I was, you know, riding in the backseat of the car, and my father was driving. And I suppose he went past the stop sign. So the white police officer came up to the window and said, Boy, don't you realize you ran past the stop sign? And my father immediately pointed back at me and said, That there's the boy. I'm a man. I'm Reverend King. If you continue to talk to me in this way, I'll pretend you have nothing to say. <laughs> The police officer was so flustered, he hurried up, wrote the ticket, and gave it to my father. You see, that's the way he spoke. He was just that way. He could be very, very intimidating. Now, my father was also the disciplinarian of the time. Uh, I must have received whippings until I was about I don't know, 15 years old. And on one such occasion, when he was administering the corporal punishment, uh, this spilled out onto the front porch. And my father said something to the effect of, oh, I'm going to beat you till you become somebody if it kills you. Something of that nature. In any case, my friend Howard, who was next door, a few years old, he was listening. He saw this whole thing, and he heard that, and he thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever heard. He fell out laughing. And so my father stopped dealing with me and started looking at Howard. <laughs> So he thought that was funny. No, 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 no. You know what I'm trying to tell this boy. I'm trying to tell him I'm going to beat him till he becomes somebody. If you continue to laugh, I'm going to help you to become somebody. <laughs> now, this is the true story. My father called up Howard's mother, told her what happened, and asked her to send Howard over. <laughs> I told the teacher how to become somebody. What happened to Howard? Well, Howard became the first top-ranking Negro police officer in Atlanta, Georgia. I suppose my father taught him how to become somebody. My parents were very good in sheltering us the children from the harsher aspect of education. But if you are a black child growing up in the South, the segregated South, you are eventually going to run into segregation. And that happened to me. Now, there were a few times when I was confronted with it, but there were two that were quite memorable that I had never forgot. First, I was very young, and uh, there was a store across the street from the house, and the white family who owned the store would come in and tend to the store. When they would come, they would bring their little uh, boy with them. And we were dear friends. We played all the time. 
he was a very, very dear friend of mine, even at that young age. But one day, I came to see him, and he was sitting down looking rather sullen. And I, you know, I asked him what was wrong. He said, I can't play with you. I said, well, why? He said, because you're colored. My parents don't want me colored playing with a colored I was very disturbed by it. And I went, told my parents what happened. And they looked at one another. You know, that way that black parents look at one another when things like this happen. They sat me down and they told me about the history of slavery and segregation. And my mother was emphatic and said, I don't want to think that you're any lesser than anyone else because of it. But already the unconscious bitterness of hatred of all white people started forming in my mind. And, and because of that, we had to love our white brethren, not love what they do, but love them in spite of what they do. And at the time, I could not understand. I could not understand how I could love anyone who didn't love me. Now, I myself had an uncomfortable conversation with my child. Now, you know the, the amusement park one time. Well, my firstborn, Yolanda, she wanted to go to Fun Town, and every time there would be a TV ad or we would drive past the billboard, she would talk about Fun Town. Oh, mom and dad, I want to go to Fun Town. Why can't I go to Fun Town? Please. Mrs. King and I would either be very silent, or we would gently, very gently, change the subject. Well, it came on television one day, and she was emphatic. Oh, mom and dad, I want to. Why can't I go to Fun Town? When can I go to Fun Town? You know, Mr. Cook, um, I've been told that I speak eloquently on various issues, but I found myself stuttering and stammering, trying to explain to my baby, my little girl, why she wasn't able to go to Fun Town. You see, sweetheart, Darling, they do not allow Negro children to go to Fun Town. And that is why you were not able to go. But I promise you that your father is going to do everything in his power to make sure that you and all Negro children get to Fun Town. Now, you know, Mr. Cook, I've been arrested many times. And on one occasion, I was talking to my wife. She was asking, well, I was asking, she was telling me that Yolanda had asked, why does daddy have to go to jail for me? I told her, well, you tell Yolanda that daddy goes to jail to make sure that she and all Negro children can get the fun time. So Yolanda told my wife, well, you tell daddy to stay in jail as long as he has to <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> there was another incident. I was a little bit old. I was in high school. And I had entered into an oratorical contest. And I did pretty well. I think I came in second place. And it was in Dublin, Georgia, quite a few miles away from the Gladys Church. And in any case, uh, we had to travel by bus. Now, as you know, the buses at the time were segregated. I am so happy that I was part of a movement that helped to rid ourselves of that shameful practice. But at the time, as you know, white patrons came to the front, paid their money, sat in the front. Black patrons would come to the front, pay their money, have to leave the front, go around to the back, sit down in the back. And this went on until the bus was full. Now, if there were more white patrons coming on, black Patrons had to stand up in the aisle to allow the white patron to sit down. Well, I suppose I didn't move fast enough when this started happening. And the bus driver started cursing at me, calling me all kinds of names. And so at that time, a, a, some defiant came into me. I said, well, I don't feel like it. I'm just as good as anyone else. I, I just want an oratorical contest. Why do I have to get up? In my mind, I was seeing this. But between the bus driver cursing 
And my teacher emphatically trying to get me to stand up. I ultimately did. Stood up in the aisles. 90 miles. Traveled for 90 miles. It was the angriest meant to cook I'd ever been. But despite those instances, um, my folks did a wonderful job in sheltering me from the harsher aspects of, of segregation. I did very well. I graduated I, from high school. Well, actually, I didn't graduate from high school. I left high school and went to Morehouse College when I was 15 years old. And I graduated from Morehouse in 1948. Then I went to Croatia Seminary in, to earn my uh, divinity degree. I graduated from there in 1951. And I went to the Boston University School of Theology to earn my doctorate in theology. And that was in 1955. And I tell you, it looked as if my life was a great big picture. But I, I married my wife in 1953. I got my pastorship in 1954, my own church. Decker Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And everything was just fine in this Christmas present reality. But three things ended that. One, in 1954, Brown v. Board of Education, Supreme Court ruled that segregation was unconstitutional in education. We knew that segregation was unconstitutional, period. Segregation was on a death bed. The only question was how expensive the white power structure wanted to make the funeral. 1955, the evil and macabre murder of Emmett Till, the lynching of Emmett Till, galvanized black people all over the country. And it let the world know what it was like to live in the South as a black person or even in other places in the United States. And on December the 1st, 1955, in our own town, Montgomery, Alabama, at the time, a brave woman by the name of Rosa Parks took a stand by sitting down. And in her doing that, it ignited a movement. Started in Montgomery, Alabama, went over the country, and it inspired movements all over the world. I was made the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, which we call the MIA. I did not choose it, I did not seek it, but it was given to me in such a way where I had to take it. I didn't have any choice. And that, Mr. Cook, is what ended my Christmas present reality. Now, there's another question you have here. This one is very important. How has this movement impacted my faith? Good question. January 27th, 1956. I know that date may not be, mean a lot to a lot of people, but it means a great deal to me. You see, when I became the president of the MIA, that was formed, we only thought that segregation, or certainly the bus boycott, excuse me, would last a week, maybe two, because all we were asking for was a gentler form of segregation. But the city fathers were so Stubborn. They refused any concession. Any. And so we decided that we were going to end bus segregation period in Montgomery, Alabama. And when the white power structure saw that the black people meant business, they started doing very ugly things. And one of the things they would do is to arrest members of the MIA. I was arrested on January 26th, 1956. I was arrested for going 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone, something of that nature. And they came and put me in the backseat of the police car. Now, I thought they were going to drive me downtown in Montgomery City Jail. They drove me around all day into the evening. I tell you, Mr. Cook, the mind started playing tricks on me. And one part of my mind said, well, these are men of the law. They won't allow anything to happen to me. Then another part of my mind said, well, they may not do anything, but they may put you in the hands of someone who will do something. I tell you, Mr. Cook, I was very frightened. And 
In the darkness, I saw a sign saying Montgomery City Jail. You know, that was the happiest I'd ever seen a jail sign in all my life. And they put me, of course, in a segregated wing with the black prisoners, and they started to recognize me. And they said, well, Reverend King, what are you doing here? Reverend King, why would they arrest me? They started turning into Reverend King, can you get me out of here? Reverend King, I've been put here unjust. Reverend King, can you do this for me? Reverend King, can you do that? And I had to raise my hat and say, fellas, before Reverend King could do anything for anybody, Reverend King first had to get out of jail. They laughed. And when my bond was posted, I heard one of them say, don't forget about us, Reverend King. I never did. You see, this was the first time, Mr. Cook, I've been arrested. It was a galvanizing experience. Ah. The next day, January 27th, 1956, I had been working at the Montgomery Improvement Association office all day. All I wanted to do was to come home and go to bed. Now, as I stated, when the white power structure saw that black people meant business, they started doing ugly things. And another of the things they would do is to call incessantly. We must have received about 30 to 40 calls a day. And they would say all kinds of nasty, ugly, violent, evil things. Unfortunately, my wife would catch the run of this because she was home taking care of the child. I don't know how she was able to withstand it, but she did. In any case, this one time, the phone rang. And on the other end was a voice I'd never forget. He said, in essence, Nigga, we're tired of your mess. You don't leave town in three days. We're going to blow your brains out and blow up your home. Immediately hung up. Tried to shake it off, but it didn't go very well. Somehow this particular voice cut me like a knife. I went into the bedroom trying to get sleep and I looked at my little daughter, who had just been born a little over a month ago, and she had this beautiful smile, and she would make me smile. Then I looked at my wife, my devoted and loving wife, speaking as well, and cold fear and anxiety came. I realized that they could be taken away from me at any moment, or I could be taken away from them, and I had to leave the bedroom, and I couldn't stand it anymore, and I went to the kitchen. One of them caught me. That coffee was somehow bring me some kind of relief. Started thinking about many things, Mr. Cook. Started thinking about my university days, our discussions about the, the nature of sin and evil in the world. But that was theoretical. Didn't mean much to me. My mother and father were 150 miles away. I couldn't call on them. You see, Mr. Cook, my religion, my Christianity, was something that was inherited. It didn't come about through hard one struggle. And so this was the first time that I was confronted with my faith. And I was fighting. So I prayed, or oh, I prayed a prayer over that. Oh, I'm down here. I'm trying to do right. I believe, I believe what I'm doing is right, but I'm faltering here, losing my courage. I can't let the people who chose me to lead them see me be losing my courage because they may lose theirs. I'm at the end of my road trying to find some way to leave this with a bit of dignity. I don't, I don't know what to do. And meant to cope. A voice, a voice came from within me, speaking to me as loudly as I'm speaking to you, said Martin Luther King Jr., you stand up. You stand up for truth. You stand up for righteousness. You stand up for justice and know I will be with you to the end of the earth. You stand up for truth and I will never leave you alone. No, never alone. I will never leave. 
I will never leave you alone. I knew that when Jesus talking to me, telling me to still fight on. And I felt a burden lifted from me, Mr. Cook. And I came to the conclusion that come what me, I knew that God was with me. Uh, three days later, I was in Reverend Avenue, Ralph Avenue. And I was sitting there. All of a sudden, I saw all these people moving back and forth and wanting to come down to speak to me, but then shaking their heads and going back. And finally, I had to ask, what was going on? Then Reverend Abernathy told me that Martin, your home was fire. He said, well, go better and go down to all right. He said, but we're trying to find that out now. Now, based on what happened to me three days ago, there was a calm. And I said to myself, well, if this is what God intends, I will try to shoulder it as best as I can. I told the people what had happened, and I immediately went to my house. Now, as I was going towards my house, I saw wave upon wave of black people, very angry, who had heard about the bus. Some of them were carrying sticks, bottles. Some of them were carrying guns. And I ran up the stairs, and I saw my wife and my child, and I thanked God that they were all right. And then one of the city fathers came to the door and said, you know, you better come out here. There may be a riot out here. So I went out. I talked to the people. My wife and child, all right. I'm all right. I want all of you to have weapons. Please, please take them all. This is God's movement. And if something should happen to me today or tomorrow, this movement will not stop because God does not want it to stop. We must love our white brothers. Not what they do, but in spite of what they do. Please, this is what we were taught. Please, let's go home. And the city father tried to come up and say some things, and the people started getting wild again. I said, please let them say what they have to say. And let us go home. We are all right. God is with us. I heard someone say, God bless you, Reverend King. God bless me. And evening went to another friend's home. I was sitting up in the bed. I was looking out the window in the street lamp in the distance. An old feeling came over me. That same feeling that I had standing up in the aisles on that bus, hatred, anger, rage. What kind of people would bomb someone's home and murder their family? What kind of people are they? Then another voice said, Martin, you can't hate them because hate is too great a burden to bear. You work on changing that system that allows people to do these things. Don't hate them, you hate the deed, not them. That, Mr. Cook, is how this movement has impacted my faith. And there have been many times, recently, in fact, where my faith was tempted, but I always go back. January 27, 1956, praying over that cup of coffee. Now, I have a sermon. Um, <clears throat> could you uh, do me a favor? Uh, you know all of that stuff I was telling you about my father, you know, the whippings, all that stuff. Uh, could you edit that? You see, my father is a Morehouse alum as well. And if he happens to read the Maroon Tiger, and see that I was talking about that. He may try to help me to become. <laughs> we don't want that. So if you could get that, that would be just fine. Now, you and I will talk after the sermon, and then in terms of the other things we talked about, 
Uh, we'll talk the next day. Do well, Mr. Cook. See you soon. The sermon that I am preaching this morning is not the usual the kind of sermon, but it is a sermon and an important subject nevertheless. Because the issue that I will be discussing here today is one of the most controversial issues confronting our nation. I am using the subject from which to preach. Why I am opposed to the war in Vietnam. Now, let me make it clear in the beginning. I see this war as an unjust, evil, and futile war. I'm speaking out on the war in Vietnam today because my conscience leaves me with no other choice. It's time for America to hear the truth about this tragic war. In international conflict, the truth is hard to come by because both nations are deceived about themselves. Rationalizations and the incessant search for scapegoats are the psychological cataracts that blind us to our sin. Yet the dead path for superficial patriotism. He who lives with untruth lives in spiritual slavery. Freedom is still the bonus we receive for knowing the truth. Ye shall know the truth, says Jesus, and the truth shall set you free. I'm speaking out on the war in Vietnam today because I agree with Dante that the hardest places in hell are reserved for those who, in a period of war crisis, maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. Truth of these words is beyond doubt. Now, being a preacher by calling, I suppose it is not the cry. But I have several major reasons for bringing Vietnam into the field of my moral vision. The outset is a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, and new beginnings then came to build up in Vietnam. I watched the program broken as if it was some idle political plaything of a society going mad all the war. I realized that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor. Long adventures like Vietnam that continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction to. You may not know it, my friends, but it is estimated that we spend $500,000 to kill each enemy soldier, while we spend only $53 for each person classified as poor. Much of that $53 goes for salaries to people who are not poor. And so I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and attack as such. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place that became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and die in extraordinarily high proportion relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia. They had not yet found in Southwest Georgia or East Hong. And so we were repeating the faith with a cruel eye of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens that they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same school. So we watched them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village. We realized that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago or Atlanta. I could not be silent in the face of such fool manipulation of the poor. My third reason moved to an even deeper level of awareness 
when Google got in my experience is the ghettos of the north for the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully to a nonviolent action. But they asked, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They asked if our own nation was using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. And their questions hit home. I realized that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghetto without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, our own government, for the sake of those boys, for the sake of our government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence. I could not be silent. Been a lot of applauding over the last few years. They've applauded our total movement. They've applauded me. America, most of his newspapers applauded me in Montgomery. But I stood before thousands of Negroes getting ready to ride for my home was bombed and said, We can't do it this way. They applauded us in the city movement when we now finally decided to sit at the lunch counters. They applauded us on the freedom ride when we accepted blows without retaliation. They prayed up in Albany, Birmingham, Selma, Alabama. All the press was so no limit applause. It's so no limit praise when I was saying, be nonviolent toward World Cup. When I was saying, be nonviolent toward Jim Clark. There's something strangely inconsistent about a nation and the press that will praise you when you say, be nonviolent toward Jim Clark. But will curse and damn you when you say you're not about to a little ground for you to be too. There's something wrong with that prayer. Now, let me tell you the truth about it. Being to me, people must see Americans as strange liberators. You realize that the being to me people proclaim their own independence in 1945 after a combined French and Japanese occupation. And incidentally, this was before the Communist Revolution in China. It was led by Ho Chi Minh. There's a little known fact. These people declared themselves independent in 1945. They quoted our Declaration of Independence in their document of freedom. Yet our government refused to recognize them. President Truman said they were not ready for independence. So we fell victim as a nation at that time of the same deadly arrogance that had poisoned the international situation for all of these years. France then set out to reconquer the former colony. They fought eight long, hard, brutal years trying to reconquer Vietnam. You know who helped France? It was the United States of America. Came to the point that we were meeting more than 80% of the war costs. And even when France started despairing of its reckless action, we did not. In 1954, a conference was called at Geneva, and an agreement was reached because France had been defeated at the NBN food. And even after that, and even after the Geneva Accord, we did not stop. We must face the sad fact that our government sought, in a real sense, to sabotage the Geneva Accord. Well, after the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come through the Geneva Agreement. But instead, the United States came and started supporting a man named Diem. Turned out to be one of the most ruthless dictators in the history of the world. Set out to silence all opposition. People were brutally murdered merely because they raised their voices against the brutal policies of Diem. The peasants watched and cringed and Diem ruthlessly rooted out all opposition. The peasants watched and all that were presided over by United States influence and then by increasing numbers of United States troops who came to help quell the insurgency that Diem's methods had aroused. When Diem was overthrown, they may have been happy. 
But the long line of military dictatorship seemed to offer no real change, especially in terms of the people's need for land and peace. Who are we supporting in Vietnam today? But a man by the name of General Key, who fought with the French against his own people. And it was said on one occasion that the greatest hero of his life is Hitler. This is who we're supporting in Vietnam today. Oh, our government. And the press generally won't tell us these things, but God told me to tell you this morning. Truth must be told. I am convinced we ought to get on the right side of the world revolution. We as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society where machines, computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people. Giant symbols of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. Nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Finally, let me say this morning that I am speaking out on the war in Vietnam because I Love America. I speak out against this war, not in anger, but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart, and with a passionate desire to see our beloved nation stand at the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I am disappointed with America. And there can be no great disappointment where there is no great love. I'm disappointed in our inability to act forthrightly and passionately against the triple evils of racism economic exploitation and militarism. We are currently headed down a dead-end road which could lead to national disaster. America is straight into the far country of racism and militarism. A home all too many Americans left was solidly struck in idealistic. This pillar was soundly grounded in the insights of our judeo Christian heritage. All men are made in the image of God. All men are brothers. All men are created equal. Every man is an heir to a legacy of dignity and worth. Every man has rights which are neither conserved by nor derived from the state. They are God given out of one word. God made all men to dwell upon the face of the earth. What a marvelous foundation for any home. What a glorious and heaven way to inhabit. Man can fade away. This is a natural experience that brought only confusion and bewilderment. They left hearts aching with guilt. Minds distorted with irrationality. It is time for people of conscience to call upon America. Come back home. Come home, America. Omar Khayyam is right. The moving finger right. And having Brit moves on. I call on Washington today. I call on every man and woman of goodwill all over America today. I call on the young men of America who must make a choice today. Take a stand on this issue. Tomorrow may be too late. But we could. Don't let anybody make you think God chose America's in divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nation for judgment. And it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you're too arrogant. You don't change your way. I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. I'll put it in the hands of a nation that doesn't even know my name. You be still and know I'm God. I didn't need to stand up the truth and the justice. Sometimes it means being frustrated. When you tell the truth and take a stand, sometimes it means you'll walk your feet alone with a burdened heart. Sometimes it means losing a job. They mean being abused and scorned. They mean having a someday your child asking your daddy, why do you have to go to jail so much? I've long since learned that to be a follower of Jesus Christ means taking on the cross. My Bible tells me that Good Friday comes before Easter, before the crown we bear there is the cross that we must bear, let us bear it, bear the truth, bear the justice. Bear it for peace. Let us go out this morning with that determination. I have not lost faith. 
I'm not in despair. But I know that there's a moral order. I haven't lost faith because the odds of the moral universe is long, but it's been toward justice. I can still say we shall overcome because Carlisle was right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Wright was right. Truth first to earth will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell Lowell was right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold swings the future. We shall overcome because the Bible is right. You shall reap what you sow. But this faith will be able to hew out of the mountain of this path, a stone of hope. But this faith will be able to go out and transform the dangling discourse of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. But this faith will be able to speed up the day when justice will go down like one of the wickedness of the This faith will be able to speed up the day when the lion and the lamb will lie down together. And every man will stood under his own vine and big tree, and none shall be afraid because the words of the Lord have spoken it. With this day, we'll be able to speak of the day when all over the world will be able to join hands and sing the words of the old Negro spirit. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last for this day. We'll sing it, and we're getting ready to sing it now. Men will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not rise up against nations, neither shall they study war anymore. I don't know about you. I ain't gonna study war. No more. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Transition here if anyone has any questions for the time period is late. Yes. Dr. King, you, you say that uh, that you still love America. And it causes so much. What keeps you hopeful? What keeps you hopeful? You know, when I had, when the uh, Selma campaign was over, and uh, that was in 65. And I was at the airport. And I was seeing black and white and brown. I was seeing Gentile and Jew, young and old. And it looked as if I were looking at the future of America. This beautiful mosaic of people all coming together and they all came together to make the country better. And I knew that that moment was not something in my imagination. I witnessed it. It was a real thing. And that moment gives me hope because I know that there are people from all backgrounds who want to see that, who want to see the promise that in America. And so America, in that particular instance, is worth fighting and dying for. Because as I've stated before, we may have come here through different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And it's very important that we hold on to that because there's been a lot to tear people apart. There's been a lot of misunderstanding. And um, that moment, that moment sticks in my mind. That, that, that moment gives me that we can ultimately achieve, but it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult. It's going to, as a friend of mine, uh, James Baldwin stated, you know, we're going to have to be willing to trade or pay the price of the ticket. And many people are not willing to pay it, but that's what will have to happen in order for this country to be the country that was promised in those beautiful words. Anyone else? 
I don't know if you'll answer this or not. I understand if you won't. But if you're looking down on us today, are you satisfied with where we're at? Well, in 1967, no, I'm not happy. No, I'm saying. Yeah, you know, I, 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 that maybe somebody, that somebody else can answer that. Okay. But um, uh, certainly in 1967, there's a great deal of division, and I'm not happy. Even 1957, I'm not happy. I've seen the dream that I talked about in 1963 basically become a nightmare. And I'm a man who's experiencing massive hopes, but I still have faith, as I talked about earlier, that we can make this happen, but it's going to require much harder work. Yeah, but maybe someone else can answer that question. Any other questions? I'll ask one. Dr. King, can you share the role that you feel women have played as part of the civil rights movement? The role that women. Ah, uh, uh, my goodness. Well, as it stands, uh, it was really women, Negro women, who were the backbone of the Montgomery bus boycott. So they were the ones who suffered a lot of the indignity. And so they really were the ones who initiated that and made that happen. Um, women have been basically in the backbone of all the movements, of all the struggles that we've had. Um, to my eternal shame, um, I am a man of my time. And uh, perhaps I have not given as much credence to women as I should or should. But I can honestly say that if it's not for my wife, I, uh, I don't know how I would have come through a lot of the things I come So, they are tantamount, and they are women who I've worked with, and Ella Baker and Satima Clark. These are women who are really, not, I can't even say the background, but they they flunked out into the front. So um, I have work to do in regard to that, That's without a doubt. I have work to do in terms of my acknowledgement. Dr. King, thank you so much for helping us remember the history that you spelled out, the, uh, the history of, of colonialism in Vietnam. It really helps me to understand um, what's going on there and bring my heart to bear and my spirit to bear in regards to, to that conflict. How, with all of the things that are happening in the world, how do we do that remembering in a, in a culture of such amnesia? Well, there, there's things that obviously education will have to be, and knowledge of history will have to be learned. But on a more immediate level, we have to deal with legislation. We have to engage in political theater as disappointing and as frustrating as that may be. We have to engage in the politics and engage in creating the type of legislation that can be brought into being to help people, to help people who are poor, to help people who are suffering. We have to bring legislation to bear and we have to make this country go that this country will never be what we want it to be until everybody is who they're supposed to be. So there are two things. There's the educational and the, the spiritual, of course, from all different backgrounds. But there's also the political engagement that we have to engage in to create legislation that will make life better for people in this nation. And so that's my focus. It's not just on the, I had always felt that any religion that speaks about the sin and degradation of the human condition, but does not talk anything about the social conditions that help to cause that sin and degradation is a dry as dust religion. 
And that's any meeting, including mine as well. And so my job is to make my religious belief something that's active in terms of truly helping people. And that means engage. We can't engage with bombs and bullets because that's not going to help us. But we can engage with the political. We can engage with that. And that's what I'm hoping that we can engage in. And in doing that, that may create the template that will lead people being educated, people being healed. But we have to deal with those practical matters first. That's really where, where I'm at right now. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Dr. King, did you feel in your time of promoting peace and um, you know, educating people and um, spreading this wonderful message that we have. Do you feel like you made any progress with white people in those times? Yes. Yes. Um, certainly, because there are some white people who died for this. And that really goes beyond me. You know, those are people, and that's in history. There are those whites who have, who knew what was right and acted accordingly. So I'll never totally lose faith, you know, in, 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 in whites in regards to their commitment to making this country better. Now, of course, there are those in power who are debating. And there are those who follow those in power who are fearful of an America that is equal, equitable. Uh, the poor people campaign, which we're thinking about at the time, is not just for black people. It's for poor whites, working class whites, working class uh, people of Latin descent, working class Mexicans, working class American Indians, working class black people in the north and in the south. We're trying to get everyone together in Washington to acknowledge the fact that we are all in the same boat and we are going there to demand that the country change its economic policy. And people have responded. So no, I have not lost faith in my white brother, my white brothers and sisters. They saddened me oftentimes um, in terms of moving towards things that I think are, are Detrimental not just to us, but to them as well. Uh, but um, I can't ever lose total faith. I can't never lose hope, although it's been tested. Anyone else? Oh, someone had their hand raised. There were two more questions over there, then we'll switch. My students have been studying your speeches and your writing. And very impressed with your, your rhetoric and your ability to compel people. Um, and one of them asked me, does he always talk like that? <laughs> so <laughs> that's their first question for you. Um, and then secondly, if you could just answer, you know, what advice would you give to young people to become more powerful speakers? Mm. Um, when I was little, I always wanted to be able to speak big words. That was something that was when I was a child, just something part of my personality. Uh, so I suppose what I'm doing now is speaking big words, but it was something I always wanted to do. Um, I would tell my mother, about one day I'm going to speak big words, mommy and daddy. You know, so uh, as it relates to young people being able to speak well, um, education. Now, now, you know, there may be people who who are not good at speaking in front. And, and, and that's okay. But if it's something you want to do, you have to, I would say, think beyond yourself. You have to think beyond. Uh, let me give you an example. When um, the first sermon that I had, you know, once we decided we were going to have the Montgomery Board, but oh my God, and I you know, had to go to the Hope Street Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, and I, I didn't really know what I was going to say. How could I be uh, militant but yet be mocked? How can I, you know, speak to them? And I was 
going and overanalyzing that. And then suddenly something said, well, Martin, why don't you move out of the way and let God talk? <laughs> Get out of your own way and let the Spirit speak. And that is what opened it up for me. And that's how I was able to say what I needed to say. I had to get out of this. So if this is what you want to do, it has to be something that's hard. That's what I would say to young people. It has to be something that is bigger than yourself where you're not focusing just on yourself. Because if you focus on yourself, you know, you become insecure and you know you may not want to say anything, but let it be higher. Let it be higher than yourself. Anyone else? There's another question. Well, uh, my question was actually for Mr. Marvin Jefferson. Well, he'll be on. Um, he'll be on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you. you mentioned your first daughter was Yolanda. Yes. Then what happened after that in terms of your children? Oh, well, with, with Yolanda, then there was a Martin III. Uh, then there was Dexter. And then uh, Bernice, my baby. Um, so, you know, I had four, four two. Yes. There's one more question in the back, and then we'll switch to. Um, my question was that, like, if you were to see segregation disappear and colored people and white people being treated equally, how would that make you feel? Oh, it would make me feel fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you get this. That, that's what America is supposed to be. We're not supposed to be separated. Because when you separate someone or segregate someone, a, 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 a group, then you ultimately begin discriminating. So no, no, I, I, I want to see people come together. You know, I don't, I see, I can see people coming together where they don't lose their, the the culture that makes them special because we can appreciate all of who we are. That's what this experiment is supposed to be. So you no, know, I'd be enormously happy. And I know in that instance that my life would not be in vain. Thank you. If you'll all help me in thinking. Yeah. We'll take a quick following after Marvin Jefferson, and we'll start with this first question here. Um, we'll go back to it with regards to how do you think Dr. King would look back now um, in retrospect? Wouldn't be happy. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it, 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 we, he, would, he would be extremely on that. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not here to talk about people's politics, but some things are worth mentioning. And when I hear that, well, Dr. King was a man who was, you know, what well, today he would be for a certain person. I'm not gonna mention. Um. It's just absurd because if you know anything about Dr. King's life and you know the trajectory of his life, he is the exact opposite of that. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a sermon that Dr. King gave in 67 called Why Jesus Called a Man a Fool. And if you listen to that sermon, if you listen to about who the man he's describing, he will seem very familiar. I'll just, be, I'll just be just like that. It would be almost as if he was speaking to that man directly. It, it, it's unreal, but yeah. It, it, you can YouTube it. Why Jesus called a man a fool. You you listen to that, you yeah. So to make a long story short, no, he'd be very happy. Um, you know, the divisions, you know, we're talking about dispelling history and all that. I mean, just, no, the violence, the violence would be very, very distasteful. He'd be very distraught because he would distraught over it in his time. And so he, he'd be, you know, I mean, thing that just happened with, at the Kansas City. I mean, just, he wouldn't be happy. No, he wouldn't be happy. Not based on my research. Yeah. I wasn't going to say anything, but I'm one year younger than you. And I've been through all that. I was born in 1930. I have seen so much as far as segregation and all of that. But to me, the worst thing is, is that the prejudice has grown so much in this country. And I just feel that you, if you were still here, you would feel the same way. Oh, yeah. Because you can see 
where it, in the 30s, 20s and 30s, the blacks were the ones that were being persecuted. Now we have other sections of people that are being persecuted. I, I just don't understand because I have, I can tell you when I was 12 years old, Leontine Price came to our mm. house Oh wow! to stay. She was giving a concert in our hometown. Mm. And I said to my, my dad said something about it. I said, why is she here? He said, because she can't stay in the hotel. But she's black. I said, well, what does that have to do with it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've seen that kind of thing all my life. Mm. And until everybody understands that we are all God's children. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that you would try to do when you were alive. Yes. Tell people, we're all God's children. Yes. Yes. Point blank. I ain't got nothing to add to that. Yeah. <laughs> I do all I said. Yes. You talked about other cultures. Mm -hmm. In 1958, my family moved from North Carolina to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I started a brand new school. At the time, I had black hair. Mm -hmm. I'm dark complexion. Yes, I'm Native American. Yeah. I was discriminated against. Yes. I was called names. And yes, ma'am, I grew through that discrimination. That later in life, I was able to, yeah, I'll go say, move into Atlanta. I inherited a team of African Americans. When we got to know each other, and I related to them, they called me soul sister. Because their ancestors had escaped the plantations and slavery yeah. and went to my nation, Cherokee, and were accepted. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah. I understand and the decoping of discrimination. Oh, you understand a lot of it. Um, yeah, Dr. Dr. King, again, that poor people campaign was reaching out to the indigenous people. Reaching out to the Mexican, he met with Cesar Chavez. He reached out to the poor white, to the African Appalachian, the poor black working. That was the whole point to bring people together to understand that, yeah, we're all here. We're all here in this country and for all of us here. And that was really, I mean, it's it was such a beautiful, such a beautiful thought. And it's something, again, I remember that that that. When I talked about in terms of what he saw when he was looking at the people at the airport and all these different cultures, and, and it, 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 he saw America. That's what he saw. That's what he saw the possibilities, and that helped to you know keep him going despite what was happening. Because I'm mean, 67, it, it was it's, we we know what happened, so we don't have to those of us who are old enough. To know. Um, but yeah, it is. Thank you, thank you for that. Anyone else? And I'll get to you, sir. I think that hatred or fear, which emotion was the most important in racial discrimination? Fear. Fear breeds hatred. Yeah, fear. Fear of, you know, losing what you call power, the fear of change, you know. And um, yeah, fear. Oh yes, that was, that's the driving thing, you know. And if, if like she said, when, if, when people start talking to one another, they start to see what they have in common. Mm -hmm. And then we have a whole have a lot more in common than we have, you know. But this yeah, right. this yeah. thing here was sad to say used as a wedge, and it continued to be used as a wedge because when working class and if, when we start talking, we. We say, yeah, I know about that. Yeah, I mean, there are different cultures and different changes, but you know, fear. Yeah, 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 sir, the other question. Uh, let me kind of ask how Dr. King would feel about the 
I feel like I've seen religion become a very divisive thing in politics. I was wondering how Dr. King would feel about that. I mean, you know, I mean, you being the intelligent person you are, you know what he would think. I mean, then it's, it's absurd. I mean, it, we're going backwards. A lot of these issues we've already debated. We debated and gone over. They call the civil rights movement the second American revolution. That's what it was called by many historians, social, you know. And so the fact that we're discussed and fought over, died over. I mean, the civil war happened, and we're, so we're still, you know, I mean, again, I'm not trying to, you know, but we're still walking around with Confederate flags. I'm like, all right. So, not me. here we are. Yeah, Dr. King would not be happy. I mean, to make a law of Too many divisions, too much. Too much. Yes. Uh, are there any leaders that you see today that you, you look up to or look towards uh, that, that could have the same impact as, as Dr. King? No. Um, uh, this is not to say that there aren't movement, and this is not to say that there aren't. I think people are looking to themselves and looking you know, at the collective and seeing what they can do as opposed to looking for leaders um, because leaders can be killed. And when Dr. King was murdered, you know, some folks started to, you know, gravitate toward Robert Kennedy. Right? And then he was murdered. And so he, he, I think people are looking to themselves. I don't I mean, there are people out there who are saying many things, which I agree with, and but as far as them leading on in the same way that King, no. <laughs> that was a, a one of those unique moments. Um and I, you know, we should really appreciate it because it's you know, it, it, I'm not saying it can't happen, but I'm saying I don't, I don't see that. Uh, I don't, I don't see it because that was something that was, you know, you don't want it to that to be taken. I mean, it can be possible. It definitely, I'm not saying it can't, but I don't see anybody per se like it can. No. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. Marvin is happy to hang around and answer any questions that you may have. Please make sure if you had a chance to do your evaluation. We love those at Colorado Community so that we can keep doing this and in conversation with the National Endowment for the Communities, community programs like this are made available. We also have some postcards and I still see some cookies. So take a look. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.